at some of these fascinating <laughs> developments. I was actually asked to give a talk which partly also reached out to the younger people in the form of some kind of career advice and so on. Uh, that was a bigger challenge for me because, I'll be honest with you, in my own family, nobody takes anything remotely practical, I say, seriously. Okay? <laughs> so, I've tried to live up to that challenge too, although I'll probably fail. So, let me start with quantum mechanics. Although quantum mechanics is more than a century old, it's, it's amazing, it's only now, today, that we are beginning to grasp how truly strange it is. And this is what I want to bring out today. The understanding we are gaining over the past few years, it's now clear, is going to transform our knowledge of vast areas of science, ranging from chemistry and material science to the foundations of physics and computer science, even mathematics. We biology, I think we have to leave that for, for G2. I'd like to share with you some in this field. But while doing so, I want to come to the point that the coming few decades is tremendous, exciting progress in science. And moreover, especially for the young people, I want to say this today, it develops, you will get a chance in these developments and be center stage. It's a tremendous opportunity filled with hope and excitement. And I appeal to all of you, young people especially, interested in science, to grasp it with both hands and go forward and take the country forward. Okay, now the outline of the talk therefore has the quantum world about which I know a little bit. Okay, and I'll tell you how strange quantum mechanics is. And as we understand this strangeness, it's so different from our day-to-day -day experiences which are rooted in the classical world that it's taken us about, about a setting. We are only at the beginning of our understanding. If you're getting there slowly, I want to convey a little bit of that. Shaping our understanding of new forms of matter, changing what we can do with quantum Quantum, quantum communication and the building of two types of computers, quantum computers, much more powerful than any computer. Okay, so that's the quantum world. And then, because I will, I will tell, turn to the real world and offer some suggestions about the opportunities and challenges of working in India as a scientist and try to give you some career advice, but as I said, I think you're better off perhaps not taking that too seriously. Okay, here's Niels Bohr. Some of you know Niels Bohr was one of the father figures of quantum mechanics. And you know, this is what he said in 1952. Quantum mechanics began to be developed at the turn of the century around 1900, and he played a key role. But in 52, after 50 years or so, this is what he said. For those who are not shocked when they first come across quantum theory, cannot possibly have understood it. So he's conveying to you how strange it is. Okay. The next quotation is from one of my heroes, Richard Feynman, who I, I had the great privilege of, of working with when I first started as a graduate student at Caltech. Feynman is more direct in this quote as he was in life. I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. <laughs> I don't understand it, I don't know when could have possibly understood it. But, you know, again, making the same point. Why is quantum mechanics so strange? Okay? You know, in classical mechanics, which many of you, many of us have learned in school, where the understanding was shaped by Newton and so on, if we take a particle, we assign a definite position x and a definite momentum p to it at any point in its evolution, in its trajectory. Right? And then you understand how does the position change, how does the momentum change because of influences on this particle. This is the basic conceptual framework of classical mechanics. It applies to very, very wide range of situations, whether it's Earth going around the Sun, Moon going around the Earth, 
right? Satellites going around or me walking, a car on the road, all of these innumerable situations are covered by this basic theoretical framework. But when you come to the quantum world, which works inside an atom, things are different. By the way, the quantum world works inside an atom and also amongst atoms and molecules, but also worked very early in the universe, shaping the initial conditions which led to the universe as we see it today. That's a grand story in its own right, how much we have learned about cosmology and how quantum mechanics and quantum physics plays a role in the origins of the universe that I won't touch on today. But I want to mention, just to whet your appetite, if you haven't heard or read too much about it. But today, we'll stay away from the large universe. And in the world, inside an atom, things are different. That's the realm of the quantum. And quantum mechanics is different because you cannot simultaneously assign a definite position and definite momentum to an electron or a photon. Heisenberg formulated the famous uncertainty. There's an irreducible jitter if the uncertainty delta x and the uncertainty in our momentum is delta p, then the product has than something, a fundamental constant. I'm denoting it here by h bar. It's called in honor of Max Planck, who played a in the development of the idea of the quantum. You cannot begin by saying that a particle has a definite momentum. It cannot have a definite value for both of them. There's an irreducible jitter in quantum mechanics, and that's all important. Okay, so we cannot assign a probability for a particle to have a definite position or momentum. Now, you might say, and this probabilistic aspect is, is vital and central to quantum mechanics. Now, you might say, and for many, many years, physicists have tried to think about, about this issue, starting with Einstein, that well, probabilities arise in our day-to-day -day world too, right? All the time. But what's the probability that I'll be uh, uh, when I try to go back tomorrow to Mumbai? Or, or, or right away, if you toss a coin up, there's some to land heads up or tails, tails up. In mechanics, we believe that these probabilities arise not inherent or intrinsic. If you, could, if you knew about all the variables involved in how a coin gets tossed up, all the rules that hit it and so on, you would have a definite given initial condition. Probabilities arise in the classical world, in our day-to-day -day experiences, because there are too many variables often, we don't keep track of them, and therefore we don't get a definite answer. But quantum mechanics is different. Because of Heisenberg's principle, the probabilistic nature is intrinsic. It's not because of not having kept track of enough information. It's just intrinsic to the basic way in which the system behaves. Okay, this is very hard to grasp that we don't have definite answers in the fundamental underpinnings of, of our description of nature, but only probabilistic ones. But it is true, it's been tested, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we know very well that this is true. Okay, this took a very long time. So in quantum mechanics, the underlying description is in terms of a wave function, not in terms of definite trajectories. And really the way to think about it is that different possible trajectories can actually interfere with each other as the system evolves. Much better actually to think of a quantum system like a wave, okay, like a water wave if you like, where the different ripples can interfere with each other, creating patterns. The, the big difference is in quantum mechanics, the wave actually all right, determines the chance or probability to find the particle somewhere or for it to have a momentum somewhere. That's not a definite quantity, but it's determined by how a wave propagates, and that wave is called a wave function. 
All right. So instead of a position and momentum, you start with a wave function, which is kind of like a water wave by analogy. It interferes, samples all kinds of paths, and finally gives you not a definite answer, but a probability for why a certain event should occur. But you can see intellectually, I hope you'll appreciate this, how different a starting point it is from classical mechanics, where Newton believed and showed that you could predict with great accuracy the trajectory of every planet and so on. So Feynman actually came up with a new formulation and here you can think of quantum mechanics as instead of going along a definite path, say the one on top from A to B, you have to go sum over all possible paths and that's how the water wave, so to say, uh, you know, spreads out as a ripple. Okay, now this is a little bit heavy, but, but let me keep going and, and get to why it's so exciting in terms of applications. This is not, this is pretty strange, but it's actually not the only strange thing about quantum mechanics. And Einstein, you know, Einstein is such a remarkable figure in 20th century physics, because time and time again, he had this amazing capacity to put his finger on the key physics issues. He was not a great mission. But he had this amazing talent to hit on us. And here again in quantum mechanics, he had a lot of difficulty accepting quantum mechanics. He put his, his finky, strange aspect of quantum mechanics. A spooky action at a distance. As well, a kind of weirdness in quantum mechanics, which is intrinsically, although tied to not, not because of the probabilistic aspect. But again, from anything we see in the classical world, and I'm this concept. This is the, the most complicated presentation, and I apologize for it. Okay, but I did want to introduce it. Here is the wave function, all right, our description for a system which consists of two electrons. And to dramatize things, one electron, the first one is on Earth, and the second one in, is in Andromeda. Okay, and this particular state of the two is such that, you know, because things are not definite, they're only probabilistic. The first electron can be either up or down in some variable, it doesn't matter, the spin of the electron. And the second one can be either down or in that variable. It's not a given, things are probabilistic. But the two are so that, interestingly, if the one on Earth is is not on Andromeda is down, that's what the plus and and vice versa, if the one on Earth is down, the is up. Okay, so now, I'm not sure, but some aspects of correlations. Okay, I'm gonna uh, try and explain this 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 correlation, this correlation between the two is called entanglement. And it's, it's something like a quantum version of a marriage, okay? That's how I want you to think about it, okay? Neither electron is sure if it's up or down, but there should, it's, it's the analog of a marriage. I apologize to my wife here. After you've been married a little while, okay? So, you know, you're not sure, you know, which side of the bed you're gonna sleep on, but you're sure your partner's gonna disturb. You know, so they're always sure that they're going to disagree. That's a given. They're not sure about the rest. That's how you, th you should think about entanglement. Okay. This is a very weird thing. Actually, it's very weird because, you know, that means that the description for these two electrons is not local. It, uh, the, the description for the electron on Earth cares about what happens in Andromeda, even though the second electron is very, very far away. <laughs> I want to contrast this with what happens in classical mechanics. If you have two electrons or two particles in classical mechanics, one on Earth, the other in Andromeda, the one here would be described by variables with reference to Earth. Where is its position? What is its position? Where, what is its momentum? Likewise for the one in Andromeda. Very local descriptions, not so in quantum mechanics. Okay, very different. Now this kind of quantum marriage, okay, is the thing which caused a lot of of conceptual trouble to all of us theoretical physicists. And this is what people have been getting. Oh, here, here. This is a quantum version of a marriage. So the two can't agree with each other, but you're sure whether she talks or whether she listens, you know, they're gonna have a quarrel. okay? Now, what John Bell pointed out in 64, you know, see how because of ignorance about 
some of those degrees of freedom. It will never happen in classical mechanics. And the curve is the expert. It goes beautifully through the dashed areas, showing that quantum mechanics is correct and no hidden variable theory, which was local, no classical counterpoint could possibly be correct. Okay, so uh, all of this sounds a bit like philosophy. What's happened over the past five or ten years or so is that people have started understanding this strange, bizarre nature of quantum mechanics. The quantum better. And in 2016, Duncan Halley got a Nobel Prize. And his key insight was electrons can have this kind of quantum input, many of and I have a quantum marriage that extends on a macroscopic scale. And then I'm going to have a material whose intrinsic is because of very different from anything we know in the world. And he had the first theoretical example and from there uh, got the Nobel Prize for this brilliant work. But I'll show you what I mean. Here's the quantum marriage. Okay, dots are a quantum husband and wife. But interested in their adjacent husband and wife. So there is between them, but there's also quantum marriages between adjacent husbands and wives, and so on and so forth. So they're getting entangled. And this is what Haldane found. And for figuring out this very intricate quantum marriage system, he got the Nobel Prize. It has one consequence. The two red dots at the two ends are left without partners because their respective partners have paired up in the red blobs. Okay, and, and that has a very distinctive experimental signature because they're left alone. They have a partner, but it's at the other end of the chain. Here, like the other end of the universe, and they can't find it. All right. So, so the the point I wanted to make to you was so. Okay, to as G two said, physics. There, you know, we've done everything so far. The matter we find, for example, water, ice you know, steam, these are all very classical. And what we've begun to find now are new kinds of matter held together by the intrinsic nature of the atom. And so this intrinsic quantum nature is beginning to now shape our understanding of material science at the macroscopic scale. And whole new classes of materials talk Topological insulators, quantum Hall systems are being discovered. And I think the general sense is that as these materials come into the realm of material science, they're going to allow us to do things which we could never have even imagined before. And I'm going to now turn, and I know I'm running out of time, but I want to turn to one possible application of all of this, which is very exciting which is that this very strange weirdness of quantum mechanics may actually allow us to build computers with the kind of power we just cannot hope to achieve by classical computers, okay? Again, this is Richard Feynman who actually had some of the first initial thoughts. And why is it that we might expect a quantum computer to be so much more powerful? Let's go back to this picture where you don't have any but your thoughts. That means if you think of a computer basically as a, a physical system which starts at point A and goes to point B, you know, in the end, that's what a computer is. You have some initial conditions which you feed into the computer. You have an algorithm, which is some set of commands which tells it how to move. And you have an endpoint, which is the final result of the computation. So it's a, it's a system not conceptually so much different from the particle I told you about. But a quantum computer would do something different. It wouldn't follow a definite trajectory. In effect, it would sum over all possible trajectories, sampling them. And it's this massive parallelism which comes inherently in quantum mechanics because of the jitter, which might allow you to do things you just could not do with a classical computer. And it, this has been dra dramatically shown by Peter Shore. There's a very, very important algorithm which lies at the heart of all our cyber, uh, you know, safety, security. Uh, this, if you have a number, every number, as you know, has some prime factors, okay? So, for example, 21 has the factors 7 into 3, 
right? And well, if you take 15, 5 into 3, and so on. Now, what are the prime factors of a number? It turns out to be a very complicated computational problem. And because it takes so much time, you can encrypt information in terms of prime factors, and that information can never be decoded by anybody else. This is the basic, basic mechanism used to guarantee all our credit card transactions and so on. What Peter Scholl showed was, never mind the numbers, if you could build a quantum computer, you could <coughs> break this code much more quickly than you would with a classical computer. All our credit card transactions would be in trouble. You know, we would really have to think very hard. Okay, so this really galvanized the field. We're all trying to build such quantum computers. I have a very good colleague in TFR, R. Vijay Raghavan, and he started building what are the building blocks of such a computer called qubits. Just as bits are the blocks, building blocks of classical computers, qubits are the building blocks of quantum. And he has built a very nice device. Here's Vijay next to his dilution refrigerator. This is what I want you to take away the following. On the left is the machine in qubits in TIFR. On the right are the five BN. Okay. And the S the mean S probability about 50% in TIFR, 40% in IBM. Okay. So we're doing better today. IBM has huge resources, they are scaling up. But it's a very good architecture, and I think we can take it. I'll, I'll, convey, that, I'll, I'll convey that to Vijay. Uh, okay, briefly, my, my students and I have been working on trying to give a more precise meaning to the quantum marriage, so it can be used here. Our two young students, Ronak is off to Stanford now, and, and we hope to, hope to do better. I'm going to come to the second part of my talk very quickly. I think I have five minutes, if you grant me that. Uh, okay. And tell you, and what I want to really convey here is, I'm sorry if some of the discussion was a little abstract, but what I want to convey here is not only are the boundaries of science moving, but in fact there are many, many more examples like Vijay Raghavan of people doing absolutely world-class research. And you saw that in Jitu's talk earlier also, uh, pushing the boundaries. I'm going to give two small examples in it. You know, there was a great privilege for us, a PSLV launch in 2015. On it, satellite dead strong. Okay, it's a really inspiring thing to go and see these launches. Up. They plot the trajectory the, the PSLV flights will take beforehand. In mission launch happens, and it, you know, when I was they fit the estimated trajectory to a T. Okay, you couldn't see it. It's very, very inspiring, and the launch. Eight satellites in that one launch. Okay, it's amazing capability. Um, I'm going to tell you about what was launched, but before that, here's another picture which is equally inspiring. Okay, which is here is a picture about the, some of the key scientists and engineers on the Mars mission. And I don't know, are you noticing something here, right? Okay, this is this is really inspiring. It's as important as the rocket going up. Okay, so this is this is what is exciting about India today. Okay, it's all women driving the boundaries of science. Quickly, we had five payloads on this satellite, AstroSat. Three of them, I'm sorry, I can't help but talking about my institution. Three of them were developed by TIFR. Okay, X-ray telescopes, these are all X-ray telescopes. Today they are working, you know, really as well as we could have expected. And so they are some of the best instruments in space today. Okay, for their purposes. I'll give you an example. This is the LAX PC instrument. If you read the bottom, currently LAX PC is the only instrument worldwide with this kind of timing sensitivity. Okay, and look at what it's seeing. Two neutron stars orbiting each other. One is more massive. It's pulling the material from the first star onto itself, which is accreting in some kind of a thermonuclear blast, which occurs every so often. You'll see that in the spikes. Okay, that's the kind of thing we have this capability. Nobody has. Okay, young scientists of India getting into this field at the cutting edge from the get go because of these amazing capabilities. Professor Govind Swaroop built for us, Professor Pralat Agarwal built for us, and so on. So, it's a very, very exciting future, I'd say, to the young people. As India grows into being one of the biggest economies in the world, we are bound to, we have to, we are going to invest 
much more in science and technology. Not only space, not only atomic energy, many other programs already exist and there will be many more. And therefore, as I said, it's a very, very exciting time, especially for those of you. I wish I were your age, you know, the young people, I would say. So I could start again. You have a chance to play a big role, not only by furthering the boundaries of science, but also aiding India's technological development. Okay, in fact, we have to face up to this challenge. There is no challenge India faces today, all right, in, in its development, which is not tied to science, which does not require science breakthroughs. I have some of the leaders of Indian science here. I hope you will agree with me on that. Okay, whether it is energy, environment, pollution, public health, food, okay, it's all tied to breakthroughs in science. And who is going to come up with those breakthroughs? in India and I want to tell this to the young people there are lots of employment opportunities today in India. lots of them in fact much better opportunities for world-class research in India I would say in many ways uh, let's say there's many more opportunities for world-class research in India than you might have in the United States or, or, or Europe today Okay, we have amazing institutions like the NCCS, uh, which uh, Professor Mayor was telling us about, but an ISE, Science Institute of Nuclear Physics, etc., research institute, we have IITs, a real commitment to have one IIT per state, ICERs, the universities are being built up, and all of these will be organizations where you can do, I'm sure, very soon world class research. Lots of options in industries, people were talking to us about startups and so on. Now, uh, more pra practically, ask me often, there's no asking me for people who write to me and say, oh, but practically, and I, 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 I put this, you can eat, a friend of mine wrote to me and he said, you know, uh, I think I want rice and dal, but I really like fruit. Do you think I'll be able to afford fruit? You know, this is about 18 years in India. Yes, you can afford to eat fruit, you know. Eat fruit, and uh, that's because you have a pretty good. Here it is. I mean, as uh, associate professor, uh, associate professor, about forty years of age, makes about one and a half lakhs per month. If it's pension, medical coverage, campus housing. Okay, so practically, just practically, there's nothing to fear. It's a great opportunity and a challenge, and I ask you to do it. My last, my last. Uh, slide is this, people will say, why work in India? If you have the opportunity, why not go abroad? Isn't it better? No, I think it's better in India. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. We have really world-class labs, okay? But there's something else when you work in India. See, science is a creative process in the end, right? You have to feel inspired. You have to feel motivated. Now, what happens in India is when you do your world-class work from India, when you teach the young people of India, you join your life to that grand struggle. You see, that grand struggle which is the independence movement of transforming this ancient civilization into a young dynamic nation. And what that does to give you that kind of energy which you know nothing else can give you. A little bit like being asked to play in the national team and hunger and hunger. Make our freedom. I have said enough. Remarkable progress will occur in science over the coming two decades across many will be sent to the stage. But physics, I assure you, is not a dead cause. As India develops, scientists working in our country will increasingly have the opportunity to play a key role in shaping this progress, pushing the boundaries of science, and in doing so, will also transform India. What a great opportunity. Because of the development of the nation infectious inspiring i think it is let's give him another round of applause